Excellent. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our friend and longtime mentor for the uh, Hesselbein Global Academy, Major General Randall Fullhart. Thank you so much for being here, Randy. We really look forward to your discussion this morning. Well, thank you, Sarah. And it's great to be back with uh, not live necessarily with uh, a lot of folks, but we are recording this because we know we have a long list of people who've expressed interest. Uh, again, uh, we were Delayed just a little bit. We're trying to get Francis and uh, Toshiko Inouye in with us as well. Francis is uh, eager to uh, be part of this. Uh, as I think all of our uh, participants know, uh, Francis uh, is a beloved uh, person around the world as she graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in uh, Johnstown Junior College in 1936. And uh, between the years 1965 and 1976, she rose from volunteer troop leader of a Girl Scout troop to CEO and held the position of CEO for the Girl Scouts of the USA for 13 years. And during her tenure, the Girl Scouts attained a membership of two and a quarter million uh, young girls with a workforce of 780 plus thousand people. So an accomplishment uh, that was noteworthy in and of itself, uh, but was recognized uh, by our country uh, with the award of the Medal of Freedom, uh, the nation's highest honor for uh, a person uh, not in the military. So Francis, we're delighted to have you uh, joining in from afar, and we hope that we'll be able to connect with you perhaps a little bit later on. So uh, it's great to see some familiar names, Argit Marishta. Um, I'm not sure where you're at today. Can you, in the chat room, could you tell us uh, where you are at physically in the world today? We'll see if Argus is near their keyboard. Uh, yes, just moved to New Brunswick, New Jersey. Well, very good, we're delighted to have you on on the uh, call today. And so uh, I think what I would like to do, <clears throat> again, uh, mindful of the fact that we're gonna have some people who are gonna be watching the recording, is just to sort of uh, remind everybody about the book that uh, was given out as an assignment uh, and that we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing my screen on and off uh, throughout our, our time together. So uh, just to remind you again, uh, this is the book uh, that we are talking about, The Goal. <clears throat> written by Elihu Goldratt. He, go, he went by the, the nickname of Ellie. And those of you who are at the, uh, the various summits know that I talked briefly about how I became associated or acquainted with the book, The Goal, and Ellie the Man. Uh, when I was uh, in the uh, United States Air Force, I was working at a very large command that was responsible for all the movement of personnel, equipment, uh, all over the world for the Department of Defense, whether it be in the air, in the sea, or on land. And at that time, we were engaged in trying to uh, evacuate forces that had invaded Kuwait, and it's called Operation Desert Shield. And we were trying to move forward all of the materials and personnel in order to accomplish that mission. And while we were successful in the end, we found that there was many, many inefficiencies uh, and things that could have been done better. And so we were given the task, myself and two other officers, to think about <clears throat> all those things that went wrong <clears throat> and then try to figure out why they went wrong and then to make a recommendation to our senior leaders as to how we improve things for the future. Uh, we spent about six months uh, visiting military installations and commercial organizations to try to get an understanding of all those questions, and then brought it back together in a very large, literally large pile, uh, and then tried to make some sense of it. And a good friend of mine had recommended that I read this book, The Goal, and by pure happenstance, we had a couple of days off and I was at a bookstore and there it was, sitting on the top of one of the tables. And as I read the book, uh, it immediately spoke to me as being very, very similar to the thought processes that we needed to use to answer the question. So we literally reached out to Elia Goldratt, Elia Goldratt, and said, this is the problem we're working on. Do you think 
the thinking process that you're describing in your book could work for us. He says, you know, we've never done anything at that scale, but there's absolutely no reason why it cannot work. And so he and his team helped teach the three of us how to be Jonas. And as you know, Jonah is one of the characters in the book that acts as a mentor uh, to the plant manager. Uh, and just again, to refresh people on, on the story that's in the goal, a plant manager arrives at his plant one morning to find that the regional supervisor was there. Uh, the plant had been failing to deliver its goods on time. The quality was not where it needed to be. They were, in fact, losing money. His message was is they needed to figure out why that was happening, what needed to change, and they needed to do it within about a month or two's time, or they were going to close the plant and everyone would lose, would lose their job. And, oh, by the way, you get no new... Uh, people, you get no more money, you get no new equipment, you get no new facilities. You just have to figure out how to change the way you're doing business uh, in order to be successful. So that's what the, the scenario that's, uh, that's outlined in the book and that we used uh, to answer the questions that we had. The goal is not the only book uh, that Ellie uh, wrote in his lifetime. Uh, in point of fact, uh, what you see here are a few of his other books. They're all about the same thinking process, but each one demonstrates how that thinking process is used in different contexts. Maybe rather than a manufacturing plant, maybe uh, it is an organization uh, that deals with intellectual activity, uh, or it might be having to do with how you do accounting uh, in your business uh, to make decisions with the exception of the one that you see in the middle at the bottom, which is called The Choice. And I'll be sort of wrapping up uh, my thoughts uh, today uh, with an excerpt from that book. So with that uh, kind of as, as, a, as a, a backdrop, let me, uh, let me put a couple of questions out there for you and eventually for those who will watch this recording uh, to think about. You know, if, you, if I were to ask you, uh, what is one word, what is one word as you think about the book, what is the one word that you think Ellie would use to say is the most important thing a leader should t take away uh, from what you've read? And in point of fact, uh, on YouTube, there is a, a lecture that Ellie gave some years ago. Ellie passed away in, in 2011. But he, was, uh, he asked that question of his audience. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what he suggested the answer was, was one word, and that one word was focus. What all of us as leaders have in common is the fact that there are only 24 hours in a day, some of which you probably ought to spend sleeping. Uh, but the rest of your waking time is making decisions. You make decisions about how you'll spend your time, where you'll spend your time. Uh, as I talk about this to our cadets in our program here at Virginia Tech, uh, I talk to them about what you say yes to and what you say no to will determine your success and your impact on those you lead in the organizations that you're responsible for. And so Ellie would say that part of what Jonah was trying to teach the, the employees and in particular the plant manager to think about is where do you need to put your attention? What is ultimately causing the problems that you're experiencing in your organization and how do you address it? Now, as you may recall from the book, it was a, a manufacturing scenario where you had raw parts that were sort of moving through a production line process and ultimately turned out something that somebody would buy, an end, an end product. And as you recall from the book, uh, there were a couple ways that Ellie demonstrated uh, where you would find the bottleneck, where you would find that which is holding the organization back, or another way of saying it, what determines the success rate, and in this case measured in how many products come out at the other end uh, with high quality. And you may recall that on one of the weekends, the, the plant manager 
needed to spend time with his family and in particular with his son. Uh, it's ironic uh, since Francis is, was the head of the Girl Scouts of the USA that uh, we had a Boy Scout troop uh, in the story. And you recall that the, uh, the Boy Scout troop was going to go out as a group. They were going to walk over a certain distance with things in their backpacks because they were going to spend the night, which means they had to have food, they had to have things to cook with and those kind of things. And when they first started out, you had some of the Boy Scouts who were really quick. They could get out in front. In fact, they were getting so far out in front that they had to tell them, stop, stop. We need to be together. We need to stay together. Uh, of course, um, as you would find in just about any race, you've got some people who are faster than others. And there was one particular scout, I believe his name was Herbie. Uh, Herbie, uh, as you may recall, is probably not the, the most athletic person, but he also had some other things going on and he was very thorough. He had on his back a very large backpack because, you know, who knows what you might need? You know, you need cans of beans, you need a skillet uh, to cook the beans in, you needed a spoon to stir them. You had all these things that, that Herbie, who was carrying on his back, but as a result, he could only go so fast. In fact, he was the slowest among all of them. And so the, the plant manager who was escorting the boys said, we've got to figure out a way to how we, how we stick together. And so the first thing he did is says, we're always waiting on Herbie. Why don't we put Herbie at the very front of the line and have everybody else get behind Herbie so that we will always go no faster than the slowest person, in this case, Herbie. Now they did that for a while, but of course the, the boys at the back were sort of getting a little perturbed and antsy because they wanted to go, they wanted to go. But it really didn't make any difference for them to go faster because you still had to get the whole troop there together. So they said, is there any way we can go faster? And so they then began to think, well, maybe if we could lighten Herbie's load, maybe Herbie would be able to go faster. He could process the trail under his legs faster than he was before. And so each of the boys, they took his backpack, they opened it up. Here, you take a can of beans. Here, you take the frying pan. Here, you. So they lightened the load. They, they increased Herbie's capacity to go faster. And therefore, even though he was still at the front of the line, they were able to go faster and get to the camp before the sun went down. Well, as the plant manager looked at that, he says, oh my gosh, I wonder if I have a Herbie in my plant. Do I have something that's holding back everything else? And do I need to be making some different decisions about how fast other parts of the, of the production line are going? as opposed to that which is holding everything up. And I think if I asked you here, uh, what was that thing? You might recall it was the NCX-10 machine. The NCX-10 machine was the heat treater. And they began thinking about, well, everything's going through there. Does it need to? Does it, do we need to have Herbie with all those things on its back, all the inventory? And of course, they figured out, well, absolutely, you don't. There are some things that didn't need to go through it. It could go a different way. And so therefore the NCX-10 machine was able to do more than it was before. Things were not getting held up. So if I go back uh, and we look uh, at what Ellie talked about uh, in terms of the thinking processes, uh, you would find that he talked about three questions. And these are, are ones that we talked about when we were at the Hesselbein Summit. And those three big questions uh, were ones that you ask as a leader every single day. Uh, what is it that we need to change around here? What do we need to change it to? And then how do we cause that change to happen? So that's, those are very key questions because if you keep asking those questions over and over again, that's how you continually improve your organization and its ability to accomplish its mission. But you have to be disciplined about asking those questions. And so what you saw in the book 
was actually a series of steps on how you leverage your actions, or put another way, since you only have 24 hours in the day, where do you put your attention as a leader? So you would begin uh, by identifying what are the constraints in your organization? What's holding things back or what's preventing you from accomplishing as much as you would like to accomplish? And then once you've identified all those, and everything has a different uh, level of productivity. You've got some people who may be more productive. You may have some more equipment that's more productive than others. So then once you've identified them, you then decide, well, how do I exploit them? In other words, how do I make sure that that person or that process is operating at its current max capacity? How do we make sure we're getting the most out of that asset as we possibly can? Then, in the third step, this goes back to the, the example of the Boy Scouts. There's no sense having everybody else going faster because the organization can only go as fast as that which holds it back as a whole. And so don't create work that's piling up, waiting for something else to happen. Of course, you don't want to live with that. Uh, and so the fourth step is now we want to elevate the system's constraint. In this case, the example was take stuff off the, out of the backpack. How do we increase the capacity of the Herbie so that it can do more uh, or it can process more or whatever the case may be? And then the fifth and final step was if you eliminate that as the constraint that's controlling things, don't have a big pizza party and decide that you don't need to change anything. Because guess what? When you helped Herbie not be the slowest, that means something else is now slowest. And you now need to focus your attention on that, back to that word focus. And so the idea here is we are constantly looking to see how do we improve our processes? How do we improve our people? Give them more capability through training, education, encouragement, uh, restructuring the team somewhat. All those things are designed to help the organization that you lead uh, succeed. So with that, uh, what I'd like to talk about here is what is the simple way besides going and taking a course on the theory of constraints uh, that you could develop these skill sets as a leader? And I'm going to suggest to you that you actually learned this when you were four years old. So let's talk about what is a question that you think a four-year-old asks most often. Now I know I got some parents in the audience here and we have some young people who may be parents someday or they can maybe reach back in their memory and think about it. You know when uh, I'll use the example and uh, uh, Kofi and Argat maybe you can you can uh, voice up on this. Uh, if somebody said, you need to eat your peas, well, what, did, what, was the, uh, what was the question you think that you might have asked back then? Either one of you got a memory of that? You say, you need to eat your peas. Well, there it is. Yes, both of you came up with the same answer. And the answer was what you're going to see here on the screen. And that is, why, why? Now, as a parent, you know that you get that question a lot from your children. <clears throat> and then you have to come up with, you, you start, my start by saying, well, they're good for you. And your immediate question is gonna be, well, why is that? And then you're, you know, as a parent, you're saying, well, because it has vitamins and proteins in it and it'll help your, your body be really strong. And then the next question is, well, why is that? And then at some point you either run out of answers or you're frustrated and you just say, because I said so. Um, now, when we talk about trying to get to the fifth level of why, uh, this is a sort of in a, in a very simplistic way, 
one of the very first processes that, that is going on in the theory of constraints. Because as you look at an organization and you ask, well, what's, what's going on around here that's not really great? Okay, and in the case of uh, the goal, well, we're not shipping products on time. Uh, our quality is not where it needs to be. Um, we have uh, unhappy employees who are frustrated uh, that their um, part of the organization is not functioning well. Or uh, another part of the organization's uh, workforce might be unhappy because uh, they are being rated on a system and they never can look good in the numbers because of somewhere else in the organization. They're not happy about it. Well, what the first part of the whole theory of constraints process was, was taking all those undesirable effects and treating them as what they are. They are symptoms of a larger problem. And as a leader, where you are trying to focus your energy, you need to focus on that which is going to make the biggest difference with your time and effort. Now, what Ellie would talk about uh, in, uh, in this discussion that he had was something called the Pareto Principle. You probably have heard of that somewhere in your, your uh, school days, but it's, uh, you may have heard it referred to as the 80-20 rule. Uh, and that would suggest that, you know, out of 20% uh, of your efforts, you get 80% of your results. Or another example is if you have a, a group of 10 salesmen who are selling products for a, a company, they'll say that 80% of your sales are coming from only 20% of your salesmen uh, because they have the skill sets, they have the motivation. Uh, and so if you're going to, to put time and effort into people, do you put it into those who are contributing the most or those that are contributing the least? And the same is true when it comes to your time. Uh, or I can even use another example that I think is probably uh, uh, very relevant to you. Do you get more than one email a day? Uh, let's say that you get, if you're lucky, 100 emails. Of those that you receive, of those 100, how many of them are really valuable to you? Okay, they have information that you really need. They have things that really need your attention or how much of it is just stuff. And so if you're going to spend your time on email, wouldn't it be important to spend it on that 20% that's going to give you the most return on your time rather than spending time just clicking through and, and uh, watching the, the, the kitty uh, YouTube video that's really cute. That's not against YouTube uh, videos with kitties in it, but fact is, is if you're trying to make a difference as a leader, you want to make the best use of your time that you possibly can. So by asking the why question to the fifth power, the fifth time, you're going to start to drill down uh, to a point uh, where you're going to find that there is a core reason for all those undesirable effects. All those things that are not going well are actually caused by one thing. And that's where you need to focus your attention because otherwise what you're doing is what we call running around and putting out fires. You're running around and dealing with the symptoms without really solving the problem. And if you don't solve the problem, even though you may address the symptom, a new symptom is going to emerge because you didn't solve the problem. Now you're gonna feel good about the fact that you put out a little fire, uh, but you haven't got down to the bottom. Now, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of either good news or bad news. The good news is, is when you get to the very bottom of the questions, you're going to find a problem that everybody's known about for years. And if you say, well, that's the problem, and you're like, well, everybody knows that. Well, then why haven't we solved it if everybody knows it's the, pro the problem? And the reason, more likely than not, is it's the result of an unresolved conflict. It's something that's held in place because two sides, two groups, two parties, two parts of the system have not been able to figure out how to resolve the conflict <clears throat> that would make that problem go away and you wouldn't have all the rest of these things going bad. 
in the organization. So what that means is, is that good leaders not only have to be good problem identifiers, they also have to be good conflict resolutioners. How to bring parties together or how to resolve conflicts. And I'm going to tell you that more often than not, most conflicts are an argument or a difference of opinion on what two parties want, as opposed to figuring out how both parties can get what they need. So a good conflict resolution means that instead of uh, having an argument um, about pay, for example, when what we really are concerned about is quality of life and health. So if I can address your healthcare needs without necessarily having to give everybody a $5,000 a month raise, we've achieved what we both need. We've not spent money that needs to be spent elsewhere, but I've achieved the need of giving you healthcare in a way that satisfies your need. But we're arguing over a pay raise when we're really talking about how do I have enough money to operate and I need, I need people to have health care. So those are just is one example. And we see this, by the way, not just in manufacturing, not just in businesses, but we see it in politics all the time. We see it in international politics. You know, if you go back and you look at history, if you pull up a map of the world today and you look at where conflict exists, maybe within a country, maybe between countries, uh, you're going to find uh, that most of the, the literature, the news of the day is about the arguing about what both sides want and try, instead of trying to figure out what do both sides need. What Ellie would suggest is that there is no reason or need for compromise. Ellie always believed that there was a way to always get a win-win. But in order to get there, you needed to understand what all parties needed to get out of the discussion. So, you know, when you uh, look at, uh, again, it's going back to the, the politics and the uh, wars and things and conflicts that are out there, many of the lines in, that are, make up our maps today were drawn as a result of a previous conflict. Uh, and the lines were not necessarily drawn in such a way to prevent future conflicts from breaking out. Uh, maybe they were just done because they put two dots and they connected it with a straight line that said, this is country A and that's country B, but the line went right through the middle of a tribe or right through a, a, a hunting ground, or right through some key resources that are needed by all in the region in order to, to survive and to flourish. Uh, and so another part of the phenomenon as you then resolve conflicts and you implement solutions is to make sure that the solution that you implement does not become the source of new problems. Uh, you may have heard an old, uh, an old saying about, let's make sure that the cure isn't worse than the disease. Uh, and in many cases, some of the conflicts and the things that don't go well are the result of well-intended actions that did not take into account the unintended consequences that would come later. So that again, in the theory of constraints, is one of the tools that Ellie talks about, is when you go back through and say, by changing the core problem, to a solution, go back and check, number one, does do all those undesirable effects get taken care of? And are there any new things though that crop up that we need to head off at the pass with our implementation process to make sure we don't end up back at the table again? So I think I wanna pause there uh, and I'm going to, I look over here and I see uh, Jim Earls guy says, it seems difficult to get people from the want to the need. Uh, do you have tips on how we get them to focus on the need? Uh, actually, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, let me see if you'll give me just a moment to uh, check something here. And I'll see if I've got a slide that can illustrate this for you. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. So in fact, I'm going to very quickly bring these up so you can see them. So an example I actually use uh, in a class I teach here to my cadets 
about this process. And so what, uh, what Ellie would uh, use is a tool called the evaporating cloud. And the evaporating cloud is a way to unearth or to make visible, clear the clouds away, uh, this, uh, the difference between what side A wants and what side B wants. And that's where the conflict is between the two. So the way that Ellie would suggest we get at this is we say to side A, in order for you to get what you want, uh, what is it that you need? And we'd ask the same question of side B, what is it that you need in order to get what you want? And so now we've begun to surface or make visible what they need. And then as the, if you're the person who's trying to bring these two parties together, uh, what you want to search for is, well, what is it that you both agree on? And the things that you both agree on typically tend to be those big things like, we want to have a happy life. In order to have a happy life, I need to get what I need. And in order to get what I need, I have to get what I want. And that, that travels through both of them. Now, there was... Uh, an important component to that, and that is this. If I use the example here of side A, I say in order for side A to get what it needs, they must get what they want because, and that's where we surface assumptions. That's like, well, that's the only way I can get what I need. Well, what if there was another way to get what you need? Well, I hadn't thought about that. So, Surfacing the uh, assumptions that we don't know about are one of the absolute keys to success for leaders. So let me give you an example, because if you break that assumption, that's where you break the conflict. So you're all parents, so even though some of you aren't parents yet, you will be. So let's say that you have a, uh, oh, let's pick a, a, let's say 14 year old son or daughter, and they come to you and they say, hey, my friends, they're, they're having a party on Friday night. Uh, I'd like to go and, uh, you know, I'll be, uh, I'll be home by like one or two in the morning. Okay, parents, so what's your reaction going to be to that? Uh, I'm going to guess that the answer is no. Absolutely not. A 14-year-old going to a party till one or two in the morning, or no way. Now, what this, will, what this will mean is, is that your son or daughter will be stomping off to their room. There'll be a slamming of doors and something along the lines of a scream that says, you hate me or you've ruined my life. So as we look at this 15-year-old um, daughter in this example, and they want to go out to that friend's party, and you say, yeah, that's okay, be home by 10. I says, no, 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 that, I, I won't stay out really late. How about 1 a.m.? You say, no way. Well, let's go back in and use our model. All right. <clears throat> so in this case, the, the daughter wants to go to a party and stay out to 1 a.m. And you, the parent, want them to be back by 10 p.m. That's what you want. Now, what does the, what does the daughter want? Well, the daughter wants to feel like her friends think she's just like them. She wants to be accepted by them. You, on the other hand, want your daughter to be home by 10 p.m. because why? Well, because what you need is for them to be safe. And, and we all know that bad things only happen after 10 o'clock. Well, at least, that's, at least that's our assumption going in. Of course, now, you know, had you done a little bit more research, number one, you would have found out that the party was at, was at your, your church, uh, that the chaperones for the party were your daughter's godparents, and that they were willing to make sure that they brought her home after the party was over. But you, did, you made an assumption, probably because I showed you that picture, this was going to be some out-of-control party somewhere, okay, with wild and crazy stuff going on. Uh, but you didn't, you didn't check your assumptions. You didn't find out all the facts that would allow you to get what you need and your daughter to get what she needed because what you both agree on is you like 
we'd like her to have a happy life. So that's, that's sort of an example of, of one of the tools that Ellie has in the book about uh, the theory of constraints and how you resolve the conflict that's causing all the undesirable effects. So <clears throat> what this is all about, uh, as, we, as we get close to the end here, is about looking at all the conflicts that we have going on in the world and understand that they ultimately result from a long-standing conflict that hasn't been resolved. And in many cases, they even might be the unintended consequences of well-intended acts. And so we need in our leaders some of the best problem solvers that we can create. And you know, if you become really good at solving problems and particularly really complex problems, <clears throat> that usually is going to mean you're going to be placed in positions of increasing authority and responsibility so that you can make a bigger and bigger impact on your community uh, and your world out there. And that means that you also have to be really, really good at conflict resolution. Now, I've got something I'd like to close with, but before I do, uh, let me pause here and see if we have some more questions that we can address. And it seems here from uh, Argy says, how would you handle the unintended consequences? Well, if you have unintended consequences, Argy, uh, you have to handle it the same way that you did in your initial uh, pass-through. Remember we said this is an ongoing process. So you may have created a new, uh, a new Herbie out there that's holding the organization back. Um, but the way that you try to handle them is to avoid them in the first place, which is why you really need to do the analysis of your resolution plan, your implementation of your solutions to make sure they don't come up. And one of the ways you do that is by bringing together as many people who are going to be affected by the process or inside the process because they can raise their hands and say, you know, that's great, but that might have this effect on something else over here that you hadn't even thought about. Uh, so involving as many people sort of in the, in the process of going through and determining what the core problem is, resolving the, the conflict, checking your work now to see do those symptoms go away? Do we create any unintended consequences? If there is one that gets surfaced, then let's put in a step to make sure it doesn't happen. And then the last two steps of the thinking process are, what are the obstacles to implementation? How do you overcome those obstacles? What are the steps needed? And then finally, who does what in what order? in order to make it happen. So those are sort of the thinking processes that are all being illustrated in the book, uh, The Goal. Uh, it's just not done in a textbook fashion. He's really illustrating them. Uh, and it's also an invitation to do a little bit more homework and learn more about it. So uh, what other questions uh, do we have out there that people may want to post up here? <clears throat> okay, I've got one coming in. Uh, okay, well, thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions? One thing I'll, I'll uh, bring up, because I think it's timely, um, the, the two greatest things facing us right now that are very front and center, obviously, are the response to the pandemic and the many social concerns that I think are surfacing and and being brought to the fore to, to be not just talked about, but to be addressed and resolved. Uh, these thinking processes apply to each of those in many, many ways. Uh, and I'll just pull one out of the air. If you look at the state of Florida and you look at the outbreak of the virus and you see the numbers going skyrocketing and the, the hospitals being overrun, what you have to ask is, well, those are symptoms of the problem. Those aren't the problem. Why are the numbers going up? Why are the hospital beds being overrun? And if you say, well, uh, people aren't following guidelines. So it's just like the P problem. Well, okay, why aren't they following the guidelines? And then you, you get the answers, and well, why is that? And why is that? Now, uh, a... Um, I think something, if you ask the why question long enough, 
what you ultimately get to in just about every circumstance uh, is a potential failure of ethical leadership. And that's why leaders matter. Because ultimately the leaders are gonna be at the bottom of the chain trying to either resolve conflict or prevent them and having those unintended consequences and negative actions happen. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was trained as an Air Force accident investigator. Well, boom, an airplane crashes into the ground. You're looking at the rubble and the, maybe the remains of the humans that were on board. And your job as the investigator is to say, there was, a, there was an aircraft crash. Why did it crash? Was it a mechanical problem? Was it a, uh, a pilot error? Uh, was it weather? Uh, was it mechanical failure? Well, whatever you start to trace down, ultimately, let's say that uh, it was human error. Well, why did they have human error? Well, the training really never covered that particular problem. Why didn't the training cover that particular problem? Well, we were having trouble with money and we couldn't extend the course for, for an extra week to cover everything, so we had to pick and choose. Well, why did we have a problem with money? So you just, you keep drilling down, <clears throat> but ultimately you don't stop at the symptom, which is, gosh, there's an airplane on the ground and dead people. So the same thing can be applied to social challenges. Uh, if you uh, recall maybe something in your, in your college or your schools, uh, something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, when we look at uh, things going on in our country with regards to civil unrest or racism or sexism uh, or any number of things, I think it would be a useful exercise for us as a nation and as individuals to start asking the question, well, why do those things exist? And I don't uh, purport to say that Maslow's the secret here, but it's interesting when you look at it and we remind ourselves Maslow said that the absolute bedrock of what we have to do as a species in order to survive is we have to have our basic needs met. We've got to have air to breathe, water to drink, food to eat, someplace to shelter ourselves, the basics. And right close second to that is we needed to feel safe, uh, whether that be in our homes, in our jobs, in our health, uh, you have to have those things satisfied before you can ever get to the things that are a little bit higher up in the hierarchy about friendship and family and respect to others. And sometimes the way that we try to feel good about ourselves is to put other people down or to hold ourselves higher than others. Uh, and what Ellie would suggest is there's a way for everybody to have all these things and not at the expense of others. And that's how you resolve the conflicts is to figure out how to help everyone get what they need rather than arguing about what everybody wants. So with that, uh, what I would turn to is the final thing that I would share with you. Ellie's daughter, before he died, um, wanted to him to, to go to the ultimate, the ultimate uh, top of the, of the pyramid, if you will, is, is tell us what are the keys to a full life. And Ellie, being the physicist that he was, did it in <laughs> using his own language and his own ways. But he said, well, you know, in order to have a full life, you require three, three things. One is you have to have enough meaningful experiences in order to have a full life. You just can't be in a cave isolated forever. You need to have some very meaningful experiences. <clears throat> in order to do that, you have to overcome failures because in the experiences that you have in life, there will be successes and there will be failures. And if you quit literally after every failure and not go on, you will not have enough meaningful experiences. Second, uh, you need the ability to collaborate with people because meaningful experiences are rarely solo acts. They are part of a community where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And third, you have to have many opportunities. And certainly the, the Hesselbein Global Summit is a prime example of those kinds of opportunities, a meaningful experience. 
So if you have those things, in order to have those things, you have to have the ability to think clearly, to not get diverted or distracted by symptoms. You have to be able to think clearly, to see the opportunities, to see beyond the failures, to see the value of collaboration with other people. And in order to have the ability to think clearly, you have to overcome four obstacles. And this really gets at this notion of the theory of constraints in many ways. First is you have to overcome the obstacle that you think reality is really, really complex. The problem is just so big, there's just no way we can ever resolve it. Uh, world hunger, world peace, too complex. What Ellie would say is you get out the, your, your P's and your Y questions and you keep drilling down because every situation actually is very, very simple when you boil it down to its essence. And it is a, is a conflict between needs and wants. He also would say, don't accept that conflict is given. That, well, everybody knows that you know, we'll, never, we'll never resolve that. Because what he ultimately believed in there is every conflict can be removed. Every conflict can be removed. Third, avoid blaming. If the first thing out of your mouth is, well, the real problem is because so-and-so doesn't, you know, this isn't going to get you anywhere. Uh, because he believed in his heart that people are good, that ultimately uh, they will do the right thing uh, when it is presented in a way that makes sense to them. And the last obstacle to overcome uh, is don't think you know. <clears throat> and the way he would phrase that sometimes is the worst thing you could say, well, I know because it assumes that what you know is absolutely correct it is absolutely the only thing, and that you close your opportunity to see possibilities for improvement and for change. And so what I would leave with you today, uh, hopefully with this invitation that's been given to you with reading the book and getting some insights, is to continue to learn more about the theory of constraints, uh, because it is leaders who are able to think clearly to see opportunities, to, to overcome the failures and to work with others that are going to allow you as an individual, not just to live a full life, but for all of us uh, as a global community to do so as well. So with that, uh, I thank you all very much for giving me some time to, to spend with you today. I wish you, we could uh, be doing it in person, but it's, this has been sort of a mini reunion, and I hope those of you who tune in later uh, to see the recorded broadcast, uh, we'll get some value from it as well. So with that, uh, Sarah, I will turn it back over to you. Well, I just want to say thank you to Randy so much for being such a, a longtime supporter of the Academy um, and, and especially for your insight this morning. We really appreciate you um, being so dedicated to the, um, to the process and to um, sharing this information with others. It's really important. So thank you again so much. And um, to everyone else, I wish you um, all the best. I hope that you're staying safe and staying healthy where you are. And so Sarah, I see, that we've got, uh, I see that we've got Francis and uh, Toshiko up on video. So we could all wave to Francis. Uh, and she's waving back. Francis, we love you and we wish you all the best. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.